Welcome everybody that's uh, uh, participating by Zoom. Uh, I would like to tell you that we're going to be recording our program tonight. Uh, you can also put your questions in the chat box and Barry will be managing those for us. Uh, tonight we're going to learn about ways to protect the Ohio River Valley watershed by citizens. Um, and we have a group called CROW, which stands for Citizens for the Rights of the Ohio River Watershed. And uh, we have two members. I don't know if Jim Shank and Susan Vondahar are with us tonight to tell us about what I think is a very unique way of trying to protect a natural resource. Um, let's see if there's anything else I need to tell you before we start. Uh, do you want us to hold questions until the end or as we go? What do you care? Okay. Uh, Barry, we can take questions as they occur. Yeah, yeah we're, we certainly have plenty of time for questions. Okay. We usually do like 45 minutes, half an hour, whatever. And then everybody here can ask questions and uh, hope we'll learn a lot. So I will turn it over to you two and thank you. Okay. I don't know if you watch the uh, Nature Speak series on YouTube. Um, if not, we're going to show one. And they've taken uh, basically stars to uh, talk for nature. Yeah. That's it. Others call me Mother Nature. I've been here for over four and a half billion years, 22,500 times longer than you. I don't really need people, but people need me. Yes, your future depends on me. When I thrive, you thrive. When I falter, you falter. Or worse. But I've been here for eons. I have fed species greater than you, and I have starved species greater than you. My oceans. My soil my flowing streams, my forests, they all can take you or leave you. How you choose to live each day, whether you regard or disregard me, doesn't really matter to me. One way or the other, your actions will determine your fate, not mine. I am nature. I will go on. I am prepared to evolve. Are you? Just switch this for sure. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and try. The is that our present culture believes that economics is primary. And that's why uh, corporations are more important than individuals. And if people get killed because, you know, corporations, it's okay. You know, the, uh, the tobacco company killed thousands of people and knew what they were doing. They got slapped on the hand a little bit and told, don't do it again. Uh, but they continued. Same thing with the fossil fuel companies. But it's because economics is primary. And humans, we're producers and consumers. That's our world. And that's what we're seeing. And Earth is purely a resource that corporations and us can own, that we can own the Earth, which is sort of like saying my little finger owns me. When you think about that, it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense for us to say that we own the Earth. So I always tell people, if you hear me say I own something, slap me upside the head so I remember that, you know, I can't own anything. I don't own a car. I don't own a house. This culture says I do. It has I have those things. But in reality, I can't own it. So what we need to do at this end, but the thing is, this has worked. There are almost a sign of a successful species is the number of, of the population. There's almost 8 billion of us. 
and so it's work. The problem is we've reached a point in which it's not working anymore. In fact, it's so serious is that it very well could destroy us as a, as a species. As as Joey Roberts said, you know, on that, you know, nature, you know, <clears throat> if we push it too far, it won't sustain us. So, but what we need to move to is reality, and that's my one hope is that we got to move to reality, which is the Earth is primary. And we are one of 10, billion spe 10 million species. And, and we do these things. Our species happens to do economics, culture, spirituality, education, politics. That's what we do. <clears throat> and we need to see ourselves in, in those terms. Doesn't like to do the full screen at all, does it? Is there a... Were you able to get it off the full screen? We've had a lot of uh, technical problems, sorry. Yeah. I'm not quite sure why it's not advancing. Why it won't, yeah. Well, and we could just bring it off full screen, but I don't, it's not cooperating with that either. Oh, is that the next? What did you do? You still... I double clicked on the screen. On the screen? Well, on the keypad. On the oh, okay. mouse pad. Yeah, on the okay. mouse pad. You double click. Yeah. Okay. Try that. Okay. Thank you. So the thing is, is that humans in the past have had to make major changes. Uh, you know, they've had to develop new stories, which, which is what we're about. We have to create a new story about who we are and what we do. But they've had hundreds of thousands of years of making those transitions. The problem is we don't have that time. Uh, my one hope is in the fact of the internet, you know, has moved things faster. But can we change fast enough? I don't know. But it's well worth a try, you know, because being human, I think, is just an amazing thing. And I hope that our species exists for, for a very long time. We're, we're talking about the Ohio watershed, Ohio River watershed. What a watershed is, is the, the land and hills, everything that the water flows from into the, the Ohio River. So, for example, for us, I would say Finley is the northern part of our watershed. And everything south of Finley moves down into the Ohio River. North of Finley moves into Lake Erie. So, the north part is part of the of Lake Erie watershed. The southern part is part of our watershed. And our watershed runs into 15 states. So what we're talking about, when we're talking about the Howard River watershed, this is what we're talking about. So it's a huge area. And <clears throat> And this is, we're like right there, sort of in the middle. I think you are. Okay. <laughs> Hi, I'm Susan Vonderfar, and um, I just want to say a little about myself first because I have a strong science background. I actually worked as a project scientist for the US EPA for 25 years. And um, Maybe you're familiar with point source and non-point source pollution. Okay, so there's two ways that pollution can enter a watershed. Either it's directly put there from a point, that's point source pollution, like the discharge from a factory or a sewage treatment plant, right? Or, and that was what was regulated initially by the Clean Water Act in 1972, um, I guess, um, EPA was established 70, by 74, we had all these environmental regulations, these acts of Congress took place. And um, the point source pollution is what was regulated. So if you were gonna pollute, you needed a permit to do that, right? Because we were gonna control those, those um, discharges. Then turned around by 1985, we realized there's a whole lot of other pollution that is not coming out of a pipe, right? It's 
what they call non-point source pollution, which is runoff. So it's general runoff from stormwater over your neighbor who fertilizes and uh, weed treats their lawn or the uh, feedlot or the um, you know agriculture production. Yeah, lots of stormwater runoff. Uh, the um, second category, whatever it is. Is uh, let's say somebody is put stuff in the river, let's say up in Pittsburgh, and the pollution comes down to the Ohio. Is that the second category? I don't, I don't remember well, what you said. So, non point sources are runoff, it's running off all the hardscape in our community, like rooftops, parking lots, roads. Point source is a pipe. It's a this if an individual throws something in the river, hmm, that's a really good question. There's definitely a point of entry, right? Yeah, you know, let's say a pipe way up on the Ohio River, way up high. Um, and it right, it's eventually going to get to us, but now is that is that still point? Yeah, yeah. I like to say you can point to it. There it is. Oh, <laughs> it's right there. <laughs> Whereas runoff, non-point source pollution, it's just kind of generally entering the watershed and flowing, right? Like off of the roadways, right? Off the rooftops and parking lots and factory development, you know, urban, suburban sprawl and all the lawn treatment. And then the construction itself, you know, destabilizes the soil and we just get sediment that runs off and that's polluting to a water way too, you know, because it clouds the water and sunlight can't penetrate. So then you cut off photosynthesis right at the source. So um, it can, it doesn't just look bad when the river's muddy, it is bad. It's bad for the wildlife. And anyway, so this is our, our lesson on, um, on water pollution, right? So we're trying to regulate that. And we've been regulating that since uh, 1973, depending where you start, you know, saying, you know, your state or your locality, your local um, municipality started, you know, requiring those permits, right? So here we are 50 some years later. The Ohio River is the most polluted river in the country by, by many measures. Coal is the number one reason because we are in, in this valley, right, through Appalachia, that coal comes out of Kentucky, Eastern Ohio, Tennessee, you know, West Virginia, and there are 33 coal-fired power plants along the Ohio River. I have a friend who has a farm in Adams County and I drive there in 90 minutes, I see five coal-fired power plants, right? It's like one every 20 miles. So that coal is the main cause of, you know, the NOx and SOx, the um, nitrous oxide, sulfur dioxide, which causes the acid rain, mixes with water, you get nitric acid, sulfuric acid, mercury, other heavy metals, right? Radiation, whatever comes up out of the earth when we tear it apart and dig it up, right? And of course, there's sewage discharge, there's septic systems, not just municipal uh, wastewater treatment systems, but septic systems that leak into the water. Of course, the erosion from construction, boat traffic, chikung, chikung, chikung. that wake of the boat constantly eroding the shoreline. Chikung, chikung. Those barges you ever sit on the Ohio River? You, five minutes, here comes another coal barge, right? That coal never stops moving. And those barges make huge wakes. And uh, the river is our slave. Jim likes this word speciesism, right? It's the new ism of when we look at our, our, um, the atrocities to the biodiversity of Earth, right? I mean, uh, the Industrial Revolution essentially made slavery obsolete <coughs> because now nature is our slave. Right, we extract and pollute and fill it with waste and fill the rivers and the air and the soil with our garbage, and it just has to assimilate it and you know has no defense. Right, there are currently six, 6,900 6, toxic discharges 
along our river. There are 40,000 active pollution discharge permits on the Ohio River, 40,000 active permits. From the Clean Water Act that permits these things, right? And the goal, the stated goal was that by 85, there would be zero discharge. That's what the Clean Water Act of 1972 says. Zero discharge by 1985, zero point source discharges. Yeah. If they said by 85, they may have meant 2085. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, they didn't mean <laughs> to eliminate it at all. Okay, <laughs> as we will see, the, the regulatory fallacy of the permit system is really what I'm here to tell you about. So, you know, 50 years since these laws, and by almost every measure, statistically, the environment is worse, right? We patched up the ozone a little bit, but with climate change, with global climate change, right? The bald eagles off the endangered species list, but we have a mass extinction. Things are really worse by um, most measures. The, you know, the toxicity, these chemicals, they just get more and more toxic all the time, right? And um, anyway. What does it take to get a permit? What's it take to get a permit? I'm glad you asked. We're going to talk about that. I wanted to um, hit this slide first. Uh, and we'll move into that right, permitting process, right? A little bit. So um, this image is from CELDF, CELDF. They're the Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund. And they came out of Pennsylvania. They have office in Ohio. They kind of mentored us in our uh, pursuit of, you know, pushing for a rights of nature agenda. And um, helped us come to realize that this is the one true way, right, to, um, for some hope for our future. And um, they talk about this box of allowable activism, which you might be very familiar with if you've been trying to, you know, to champion some causes yourself, right? You're preempted by the state and federal government, right? Yet local communities are not allowed to make laws that interfere with interstate commerce, you know, fracking, oil and gas, they, the federal government regulates them, your community doesn't, right? We can't make a plastic bag ban in the city of Cincinnati if the state of Ohio isn't happy with it, right? The state of Ohio says we love plastic bags, don't they? So yeah, and then Jim talked about this history we have of treating nature as property. That's the legal precedent in our in our system of government. For 250 years, courts have decided that that's the value of nature is, you know, who owns it and who has more money and has wins the corp, you know, the decisions that that's the corporate privilege that those decisions are in their favor. So we have these precedents that honor the commerce, but nature has no voice. There's no voice for the natural world for ecosystems or even communities for that matter of people, right? So I'm going to talk specifically about the regulatory fallacy in this permitting process that we think that something's in place that's protecting us, right? And it's very complicated. Lots of laws and legal ease, right? And a huge process. But the bottom line is, if you get the permit, you are legally permitted to pollute. That's what the permit tells you. It makes pollution legal. Now, there's lots of regulatory agencies, and depending on what you're trying to do, you may need permission from a number of them, right? You might need a combination of um, permits. I'm going to uh, have you look at the permits for clean water. The NPDES, the National Pollution Discharge Elimination System, that's the Clean Water Act's um, regulatory process. You need that NPDES permit, right? Pollution Elimination System. Doesn't it sound like it's trying to eliminate pollution? But what it is, is a permit to eliminate 
pollution from your sight. That's what it's permitting, the elimination of the pollution on site into the slave of the river, right? You must gobble this up now, river, because we're permitted. Go on these websites. I encourage you to go to these websites and go to their permit process. You'll see images like rubber stamps sitting there, right? We're here to serve you. We're here to see that you get your permit. That's why they exist. Is there any uh, thing in place like, okay, you're allowed to do, you know, 100, whatever. And then, you know, maybe any, any encouragement to decrease their pollution or to at least keep it? Well, there's always, you know, lip yeah. service. Absolutely. Absolutely. Are they enforced? And are they well, there's an enforcement process, yeah. I don't want to, um, I can go here. My next slide, don't get me wrong, this compliance process is complicated, it's expensive. There's, those agencies exist because of the application fees, the non-compliance fees. If they, if they um, violate the permit, they'll get charged, you know, a non-compliance fee and money will go to the state or you know the local agency with that but it's it still doesn't stop them from being allowed to permit if they cross it and and it's complicated i mean it's the entire industry i mean it takes a battery of people and there's an entire industry of people that are going around making sure you know you cross the t's and dotted the i's you use the right software to integrate your data you you know um, applied in a timely manner and you report it in a timely manner and all this is very well documented. Well, one of the problems is, is the corporations are developing, they're basically setting up the laws. So, you know, they're not gonna restrict themselves much. The permitting process allowed for industry to continue to pollute. It permitted them, it legalized the pollution. That's what it did. <laughs> Uh, is there a limit to how much pollution they can pollute? Well, I mean, maybe, <laughs> maybe. It depends on the body of water. A more sensitive, um, like a smaller stream, you're not allowed to discharge as much into that as you are the major, you know, body of water. So, right, right. It's like, oh, what can the local um, ecosystem absorb? They'll max that out. But what there's not a limit on, can we go back? Is that a possibility? Um, <laughs> what there's not a limit on are the number of permits. There's 40,000 active permits on the Iowa River. You know, and they, they need to um, listen to public comment, but they're not required. There's no mandate that they heed it, right? Oh yeah, we're listening to you. Okay, you've got, you come to the meeting, you've got your, um, two minutes to speak and you give your impassioned mm -hmm. speech you've been working on all week, right? And okay, thank you very much. And I don't know, they're browsing Facebook or something. <laughs> okay. They're not even there. They're yeah. not even there. I, I've gone to those kind of hearings and the people that are supposed to be listening, have a secretary there who has no power, very nice lady, not doing anything, has nothing in the decision-making process. Uh, when I found the that decision's out, been and, made by the yeah, time the meeting comes up, yeah, the decision was for the made. Duke pipeline. They had plenty of hearings, and the people that were there on the dais weren't even from the regulatory committee. They were secretaries, administrative personnel. That's so when I found that out. I actually was livid. Right, <laughs> makes you feel a little foolish, doesn't it? I'm not a corporation. Right, you so don't have enough money. I am in your a real pocket. person. Right. Well, I live in the future, so yeah. if I was a corporation, maybe I'd do better. For sure. <laughs> you have a lot, you got a lot deeper pockets if you're a corporation, yeah. But you know, all of us will be dead before there's a real problem. Mm -hmm. Where the hell are the younger people that are going to really suffer from this? I don't right. see any here. No, yeah, we we're trying to, to put, put our social media. Like, you know, they might not come to the Sierra Club, but they're out there, you know, some are out there, you know, so they're out there, so they're out there, and they're out there, and they're out there, and they're out you know, I mean, what I, yeah, yeah. Right, yeah, right. Yeah, but yeah, they're, 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 I mean, I don't want to hear that. I think they're doing more than people are A lot of people are advocating through social media and emails uh, rather than coming to organized meetings like this. 
And also, yeah. all of the young people that have children, they don't have any free time. We're the only people having free time is the, the retired people. So I don't mind that that we might be the demographic that we're I'm speaking for my grandchildren and my children and, and they're doing the best they can in the current economic situation where almost everybody has to work, you know, and mostly you have to work two jobs. And especially these younger people with children that have three or four children, they're extra burdened down. Right. And it's gonna take all of us. You know, because this is a huge institution. This is not coming down easily. And a lot of organizations, and if I may say it, Sierra Club itself depends on, you know, a lot of academic or groups depend on this process for funding, for research, They're kind of deeply embedded in the system. You know, there's a 400 million dollar program you know to save lake erie and who's you know people got their hands out for okay i'll do i'll collect this data i'll do this research i'll look at these invasive species i'll look at you know this program of trying to convince farmers to not you know only fertilize when they need to and how much they need to and and it's it's um, factionalizing us right so we're all in our little camps trying to do our little projects and um you know, it's like a big vision of a change in the in shifting the entire paradigm of how the system works is what we're advocating for. We say that, um, let me see what we say, because where's our next? Okay, this is where Jim's supposed to take over again. But we're talking about an entire paradigm shift away from the fact that pollution is permitted, right? where nature has rights to exist and thrive and flourish unharmed, right? It's not our property to do what it wants. It's a, a person, a legal person that has legal standing in court that can come in and say, you should not pollute me, right? And that's kind of what we're looking at here. Let Jim talk. Yeah, the only people who can <clears throat> control, for example, the pollution of the Ohio River is those who own the Ohio River, which I believe is Kentucky and West Virginia. And unless they step in, which they're not going to do because we do have the best government money can buy, unless they step in, <laughs> nothing will happen. And as I said, the corporations basically write the laws, you know, and to suit themselves. And uh, and so that's what we're dealing with. So as a culture, we've got to, we've got to think totally different. So Orsanko, you know, was set up to regulate, but the last few years, they, uh, <clears throat> people, people came and talked about the need for Orsanko to retain this. I bet you a thousand people came. Who no knows Orsanko? Who knows where the Ohio River Sanitation Commission? was established in uh, 1948, and it was a statewide collaborative long before EPA that said, okay, we want to control um, and regulate pollution to the Ohio River. And they've been doing it until just a couple of years ago. And they became voluntary. The agency is now um, an advisory committee, not a regulating body. And because the regulating body of Orsenko is made up of politicians, you know, who are then bought off. And that's basically what happened. They got bought off. And so now they recommend rather than regulate. And, and you know, we've got the problem with, with fracking uh, and fracking waste. Communities can't stop that from coming in their community. And so we're really talking about, when we talk about rights in nature, we're also talking about the rights of, of community. And, and again, recognizing that we are nature. We're not separated from nature. Um, and in Cincinnati, the plastic bag, uh, we passed a, a, a ban on plastic bags. And so the state passed a law saying that we couldn't ban plastic bags. So, you know, again, again, because the bag companies got to the politicians and, and paid them off. Chemical companies. <laughs> Did I do it? No. Let's the right side. 
Microsoft. Mm. <laughs> Sounds good anyway. I think yeah. our next one was might be a closer on the um the, that Wendell Berry quote that was so beautiful. Oh there we go. Thank you. Well, <laughs> there was a Lake Erie Bill of Rights, uh, which uh Seldef helped them develop. And so Seldef started trying to help communities, you know, uh stop uh pollution by following the law and what they realized was you know what we've just been talking about it doesn't work so they switched to saying we've got to change the way we think and so the lake erie bill of rights millions and millions of dollars were put in by corporations to stop that the, the community from passing about two-thirds of the of uh, <coughs> toledo passed the charter uh, so, which recognizes the Lake Erie, the rights of the Lake Erie that have been ignored. And what this means, if we recognize the rights, as uh, Susan said, then the river can sue. And, but they passed it and within uh, 12 hours, a, uh, a farm, you know, a, uh, what do you call it, the factory farm uh, sued them. And then the state of Ohio sued them. So Suit the city of Toledo, the city of Toledo uh, for passing this. So it's still in the courts, but they're going to lose, and we do know that. But and the reality is, we're going to lose a lot of things until it finally happens. But it is happening. These, this is just a timeline of, of things that are going on. Uh, in 2006, uh, city in, in uh, Pennsylvania. Uh, was the very first place in the world to recognize the rights of nature and law. Uh, 2008, Ecuador became the first country to recognize the rights of nature in their constitution. Now, they haven't done a lot until the last couple of years. And in the last couple of years, there is a forest that sued a mining company that was destroying the forest. And the forest won. And so that is happening um and uh <clears throat> so ecuador bolivia has also passed it and i believe panama so it is starting to spread and and uh so you know we're and actually selda was involved in helping all of them uh with these laws oh and also chile is they are redoing their constitution and they're going to put the rights of nature in, in theirs so these are just some of the, the things going on. In New Zealand, the same kind of thing. There's a, the native peoples there are, are, live along a river and they recognize the rights of that river. And a community next near it dumped up garbage into the river, the river sued and they had to move. They won and the city had to remove the waste. <laughs> so it, it is a possibility, it's starting to work. And for me, this is the first movement, I, you know, for 40 years, you know, I've worked with Imago, I've worked with all kinds of organizations, but I've been looking for something that looked like it made sense, that it was moving in the direction it needed to, which is recognizing other species as, as they were part of it, and number two, had legs. And, and the rights of nature seems to be that uh, movement for me. So Thomas Berry calls himself a geologian says our challenge is to create a new language even a new sense of what it is to be human it is to transcend not only national limitations but even our species isolation to enter into the larger community of living species this brings about a completely new sense of reality and value so we have to change the way and i tell you all we have to do is change the way we think so, <laughs> That's all. That's all. No, I left that in there. I know we said to take it out, but it's just a reinforcement of that, you know, this whole shift of, you know, not nature, not property, but something that has the right to exist. This is a social justice movement. It's a social justice movement. I, because. And it's one sense of slavery that we still accept you know that we hold nature as slaves and we don't even question it 
you know, we say I own. That means it's your slave. So <clears throat> Crow is formed and uh, we have a number of committees. Right now, we have a bill of rights that we've developed. <clears throat> Over there, there's an uh, introduction to the bill of rights, which tells you what you're doing, also a brochure. Um, so our goal right now is to educate people about this concept. And uh, so we're doing this kind of thing, but we've set up five, five committees. Um, <clears throat> we have a social media, and I'm actually working with my granddaughters uh, and some other people, and we're going to do some things on TikTok, you know, to reach young people. And what they say is young people are scared to death, which they have a right to be. They don't know what to do. And so our goal is through TikTok, and then we're also going to have a conference, a youth conference, in which we will also deal with this to help young people, you know, figure out what they can do to help them make a change. Is this, uh, this organization, is it all along the High River, or is it just here in Cincinnati? Or? Right now, we're focusing on Cincinnati okay. and That's greater started. Cincinnati area to start it. Uh -huh. And our goal is to get the city of the uh, uh, council to pass it, to pass the right to put it on the ballot. And oh, it, no, so it's, it's, as a charter amendment like the city of Toledo did. Oh, yeah. okay. a, 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 an amendment to our city charter. And either the city council can do it or we can do it by petition. Our hope is that the city council do it. Uh, if not, then we will go for a petition. And we might start doing the petition anyway just to get on moving. We have an education committee, uh, whoops, a schools committee. And so this is dealing with the uh, uh, colleges and high schools. Uh, we're, right now, we, as I said, we're looking at the conference, uh, which is sort of connected with social media and schools are, are working together on that one. But <clears throat> the, the school thing, we're actually starting to focus on the uh, middle school. Uh, <clears throat> somebody said, you know, the sixth, seventh grade, they're the ones that are still willing to, you know, to listen and have time. But once you get to the high school, it's much harder because they're involved in so many different things. Churches, which I think is just a huge uh, thing within our culture. You know, and churches really need to uh, talk about justice in, in these terms. Uh, and we have an environmental group. Uh, that's basically a group that's talking to environmental groups like you all, <laughs> you know, this is, this is another committee we have. We have a group working with seniors, and then we have some people talking to the government, to the uh, council people, et cetera, et cetera. So if any of you want to get involved and any of this is interested in you, let us know, and we can uh, tie you into one of these organizations. So any other questions? There was something um, like in, two, I want to say it was after the, the uh, 2017, 2016, 2017, there was, I think it was trying to amend or continue the Clean Water Act or something. I, I, I remember getting a lot of phone calls around that time and people knocked on my door. My, my niece was involved with it. And um, I think I wrote a letter to the governor at the time, but I don't remember the outcome of that. Do you know what I'm talking about at all? Does that I think I know what you're talking about. I think about. they were trying to. Well, at the end water. of this administration, Obama put more restrictions on discharges redefining what a U.S. waterway yeah. is to include some wetlands, uh -huh. some smaller streams, right, to give those clean water protections. So you need your permit <laughs> to, you know, and then Trump got rid of all that. That's what and so about. now um, I don't think Biden's I brought it, it back yeah. yet. I think it was called a clean water something amendment or something. I can't remember. Yet. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I, yeah, I, I remember so there's so much going on there. Yeah. 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 Any other questions? Are there any online questions? Uh, we don't have any questions in the chat. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, I think that it's, it's almost hard, you know, to really get your mind around this, right? The river's coming into court and suing. You know, the company, yeah, yeah. Um, the um, proposed uh, charter amendment, the Cincinnati charter, would that be something that our legislative committee, you know, would, 
get involved in or the political committee. I'm not quite sure whose jurisdiction that would. Absolutely. Be. Yes. Absolutely. I mean, we need. Yeah, to be able to Mother support Nature it. needs all the help. Well, we need the help okay, because she doesn't need us. But if we're going to continue to, you know, survive as a species. Like, Would we need all of these groups involved in pressuring city council to pass it? What about uh, groups like um, prodigious nations? Are they yeah. involved? Are anybody involved in that? Yeah, we're involving them because basically they've been talking about it. The same right. concept for years. So, yeah.